It is my honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Richard Horton, our next speaker, who is widely known for his work as Editor-in-Chief of The Lancet and his commitment to furthering global health over the last three decades. But what people may not be as familiar with is his commitment to creating opportunities for the next generation of researchers and experts in global health metrics. I am a third year post-bachelor fellow at IHME and have worked on three rounds of the Global Burden of Disease Study. My work focuses on measuring the health outcomes of neglected tropical diseases, and in my estimates, I see the incredible impact recent mass drug administration initiatives have had on decreasing global burden. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Horton last year when he came to discuss the future of health metrics and the role that we, as young researchers, can play in influencing its direction through the questions we pursue, the quality of our methods, and the dissemination and accessibility of our results. He inspired us to think critically about the implications that our analytical work has on the direction of future research. We at IHME are continuously impressed and thankful for his unwavering commitment to our work and for his role in shaping the modern global health agenda. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Horton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. That's uh, seriously kind. Um, the most important thing I'm going to say, because I'll forget it at the end, when I finished, you've got to run out of the back, and there's the reception. OK? So maybe not run. But anyway, you have to go out of the back, and there's the reception, and lots of nice things. Um, now we're going to get serious. Everything you've heard so far has been the appetizer. Um, but now we've got to really talk about where the GBD is going to go. Is that uh, Julio Frank, I see. Good to see you, Julio. Um, you're very welcome. <laughs> Star appearance. <laughs> uh, so, where is global health going next? We have a new Director General at WHO, Dr. Tedros. Everybody's very excited about him being in place. He has a new mandate. He expresses it like this, that all roads in global health should lead to universal health coverage. But we have to put Dr. Tedros in context. There are other things going on around universal health coverage that we need to pay attention to. The Secretary General of NATO, for example, the former Prime Minister of Norway, Jens Stoltenberg, has commented just a week or so ago that it is a more dangerous world that we live in. That is the context that we have to consider for the future of the GBD. Now, we believe that we have an answer to this dangerous world, and we call that answer the Sustainable Development Goals. And the frame that I want to talk a little bit about now for the next 20 minutes or so is the frame of planetary health as the science and the politics of sustainable development. But let's begin by asking ourselves, what is planetary health? It sounds a very odd concept, and Chris has pulled my leg for several years about the idea of intergalactic health as the next thing we're going to do. What is planetary health? It starts, the idea started to germinate in our minds with Martin Rees, the former president of the Royal Society, not some maverick scientist, but a serious-minded person who wrote over a decade ago now the rather alarming statement that I think the odds are no better than 50-50 that our present civilization will survive to the end of the present century. Surely he was exaggerating. But then along came Jared Diamond in 2005 with his book, collapse. And in this book, we can summarize it by his isolation of several determinants for civilizational survival. Climate change was one. This is going back in the eons of time. Hostile neighbors, loss of trading partners, and environmental crises. And then a fifth one, which was clearly, in many ways, the most important a failure to adapt. 
So what were the adaptive mechanisms that we need to embrace if we are going to survive and not collapse as a society? Johann Rockström came in 2009 to try and set a frame for what our priorities are with his concept of planetary boundaries. Not just at the 12 o'clock position, climate change, but a whole series of other dimensions that were going to shape our chances for sustainability, and you can see them there. And then we can take it to our present time. For many of us who are interested in the intersection between the environment and health, somebody called Anthony McMichael is a rather seminal figure. He died several years ago, but amazingly, amazingly, he had just finished his book, which was published earlier this year, and colleagues of his in Australia managed to piece together the manuscript and publish it. It's the first manifesto statement about climate change and the health of nations. And in this book, he writes about the great undercurrents that shaped, again, this idea, the fates of civilizations, their cultures, ideologies, and power structures. So this is where we've got to in our thinking about the context in which we are spending today discussing health metrics, the fate of our civilization. So let's just think about that idea in the context of what we mean by sustainable development. What is sustainable development? Because we haven't well articulated this at the global level at all. First of all, we know that it's about universal concerns. The second, it's about not just equity today. For us, it's about intergenerational equity, equity the idea that the future matters as much as the present. It's also not just about us, our species. It's about, about the relationship between our species and the biosphere. The concept of the oneness of life, our interdependency, not just with each other, but our interdependency with other animal and plant life. It's about the symbiosis between that biosphere, of which we are a small but important part, and the physical forces, the physical systems of our planet. And finally, it's about the fact that the way we organize our lives, politically, economically, socially, technologically, matters, and are going to be the great determinants for our future success or collapse. So we were trying to capture this idea of planetary threats and made the case for several years ago now that we needed to move from public health, even global health, to this idea of planetary health. And an urgent transformation required in our values and practices based on this idea of interdependence and the interconnectedness of the risks that we face. We were extremely grateful to the Rockefeller Foundation for supporting a commission on planetary health that was led by Professor Andy Haynes, former director at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And to cut to the chase, after two years of work, the definition that the commission came up with for planetary health was simply this the health of human civilizations and the state of the natural systems on which they depend. Now, I trained a long time ago as a medical doctor, and my primary concern was the patient sitting in front of me, taking a history, doing a physical examination, reflecting on whatever the differential diagnosis was, and then doing something about it. And then, of course, as I grew up, I became enlightened and heard about something called public health, and then realized that we had to think about the community in a broader way. That was my unit of concern, society. And what we're inviting with this idea of planetary health is to select as our unit of concern, indeed our unit of analysis, our civilization that we share together. The example I would use is like a, a city like Seattle. 
You can describe the city of Seattle in terms of the bricks that make up the buildings. Just like we can describe our planet in terms of the individual members of species that occupy our planet. But simply counting and describing the bricks in Seattle doesn't tell you anything about Seattle. The only way to really grasp the texture, the fabric of this city, is to go out there and observe it at a much larger level than we usually might do. And that's what we're inviting us to do when we redefine the idea of health in civilizational terms. Now, this idea seems to have caught on a little bit. The first professor of planetary health was appointed in Australia, Professor Tony Capon at the University of Sydney. The Planetary Health Alliance has been established by Sam Myers at the Harvard School of Public Health. We are seeing planetary health as the subject of symposia at academic conferences, as the subject of interdisciplinary research presentations at those conferences. The Rockefeller Foundation is continuing to invest in planetary health through new grants, again, for which we're very grateful. And there's even a small journal, which I'm very proud of, at The Lancet, called The Lancet Planetary Health, to try and build this new discipline. Meanwhile, there's something else going on in the world that we have to pay attention to. We are living through an epochal reevaluation for the future of our world. And that is the broad, if you like, hinterland that we have to reflect on as we discuss the GBD. Hurricane Maria is currently, has current, recently ravaged Puerto Rico, and we have seen here the front cover of time from just a week or so ago, we have seen the dramatic impact of extreme weather events that might finally get through to some rather recalcitrant presidents about the importance of what is taking place with our climate. The Pope who has assumed an unrivaled leadership position in our moral universe in his first encyclical, which I encourage you to read because it is the most inspiring document, Laudato Si, in which he writes about the earth herself, burdened and laid waste is among the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. We are living in a new era, the Anthropocene, functionally and indeed stratigraphically distinct from the past era, the Holocene. But this is not just a steady transition that we're going through. We are seeing what's described as the Great Acceleration from 1950 onwards. Here we're looking at over several hundred years from 1750 to just after 2000. And we're looking at various indicators, just a few indicators of the impact of us as a species on our planet. Rises in, for example, plutonium de deposition, and just the sheer stuff, the material stuff of our existence, from concrete to plastic to pollution. This is a report that you can't go out and see. It was leaked by the New York Times. It's sitting on President Trump's desk. It is the best available scientific evidence about the likely impact of climate change on the United States. It's waiting for his approval. He has yet to approve, approve it because apparently he has other things on his mind, such as the NFL. But this is important. And I'm not going to explain it in great detail, except to say that you can see in these mid-20th, 21st century and late 21st century scenarios for both lower emissions and higher emissions, the extent of the orange is what is telling you about a warning. It's not only new threats such as climate, it's things that we thought we might have defeated and addressed some years ago. This report came out just 10 days ago 
looking at the extent of food insecurity in the world. And you can see the, the peak of food insecurity around the 2000 to 2005 time period. And then a decline. We were making an improvement. And now we're seeing just in the last year or so an uptick in the number of those who are either undernourished um, or the prevalence of undernourishment. And when you put some of these ideas together, which traditionally many, many in the communities we've worked in have not looked at the intersections between, for example, environment and mortality and morbidity, you can begin to see how important and toxic these relationships can be. This work coming out from Maria Nera's department in WHO, looking at the contribution of environmental effects on child mortality, about 1.7 million of the, of the around 5 million under 5 child deaths caused by a polluted environment. I get really sick of hearing people say how the world is getting better. Because the world is not getting better in the sense that it is not a safer place that we are inhabiting. And we must not be lulled into a false sense of security by the global burden of disease as we see these beautiful smooth curves telling us we're doing well. Because the context tells us something very different. My God, it's even worse than what I've said. If you believe in democracy, and maybe not all of you do, and you have to wonder sometimes. I've just read Hillary Clinton's book, What Happened, and boy, it is a hell of a read. And don't believe what people have said in the media, that she doesn't take responsibility for the election, because boy, she spends every chapter blaming herself for what happened. But it exposes the threats to American democracy today. And this is borne out by the Economist Democracy Index that, was, that is published every year. And this is the latest version of it. And when you look at supposedly the least worst political system that we have on our planet, the proportion of full democracies in the world is tiny, tiny, tiny. Only not even 5% of the world's population lives in a full democracy. And indeed, what we're seeing today is in this imperfect, perfect political system of ours, we're actually seeing a recession in democracy. These are the headlines for democracy today. A de global democratic recession. And for this country, a demotion. A trust deficit causes the US to become no longer a full democracy, but a flawed democracy. Asia's upward momentum stalls. Latin America suffers a populist hangover. Democratic backsliding in Eastern Europe. Sub-Saharan Africa lagging behind on formal democracy. And the long Arab winter continues. We are not becoming a more peaceful world either. If you look at the state of the world's peace, and there is a peace index, you can see large tracts of our planet are actually most definitely not in a state of peace. And if you track that over time, we reached a peak of peacefulness in the modern era around 2007, 2008. And then there was a dramatic loss of peace and we're, we've been bumping along on a much higher level for the past five years or so. And then we have crazy people who come along and want to deny science and having a disproportionate impact on our global conversation. And then we have sheer social fracture in a way that many of us just can't imagine is taking place before our eyes. This daubed on a wall in Charlottesville. Make America white again. Now, I'm not laying all of the responsibility on the United States. I come from a country that's taken rather a sharp step back in global affairs. Thanks to Brexit, we've got this wonderful fantasy in Britain 
and share it with me because it's great. You know, we used to run most of the world, all the red stuff on, on, on countries, so proud of our colonial history, and now we want to reinvent it again. We're going to become global Britain, a great global nation, by withdrawing from one of the most important political and economic unions that saved peace in the post-World War II era. Europe, a beautiful center and origin of enlightenment thinking, but with a perverse predilection to destroy itself on many, many occasions, pulled itself together at a moment of crisis and decided that its trajectory was going to be something entirely different and created, of course, an imperfect union. Aren't all unions imperfect? But the beauty of the idea, of the ideal, is what will save us from conflict and gives us an opportunity for renewal. And Britain decided to pull out. It's hard, it's hard to, it's hard for me, it's hard for me to stand here as somebody from the UK and be proud of my country. And we are also seeing an abdication of global leadership from the United States as we see a rapid handover of power to other countries, a different kind of Asian pivot to the one that President Obama thought of. Now, I'm a great supporter of China's global leadership. I'm proud of the relationships that we have with Chinese scientists colleagues and their work on, for example, child and maternal mortality, healthy cities, strengthening their universal health coverage. And we have great collaborations with China. But one country withdrawing is not an answer to some of these global predicaments that we face. Thankfully, we have associations that are powerful and increasingly important, such as the G20. And those of you with a keen eye will spot a very important man there. In fact, he's the coolest guy in that group. And there he is, Tedros, with his dark glasses. And he set the context for the way we need to think about global health. And this is what he said at the G20 meeting in Hamburg. Pandemics, health emergencies, and weak health systems not only cost lives, but represent some of the greatest risks to the global economy and security that we face today. And his frame, although he says to us in the global health community that all paths lead to universal health coverage, his message to presidents and prime ministers is the flip side of that, related, but a different way of presenting it, and that is that it's all about global health security. So, that is the dire context that we discuss the GBD in. So let me ask, how do we measure and monitor planetary health? A great start, a great start is this paper monitoring the progress and projecting attainment for the Sustainable Development Goals, looking at a proportion of the health-related Sustainable Development Goals. And putting that, it was controversial in World Health Report 2000, but it's not so controversial now, to put countries in a league table to see how well they were doing. And whoever's from Singapore here, congratulations, because you came top of the charts, um, slightly ahead of Iceland, Sweden, and my, now I'm very proud to be half Norwegian because I don't particularly want to be half British at the moment. <laughs> and another innovation, which we haven't talked too much about in this paper, is the Universal Health Coverage Index, an extremely important development so that we can track and monitor progress on 3.8 um, in the SDGs. If you read all 400 pa pages of the booklet that I hope you have in front of you, you will see the future trajectory for the GBD. There is a promise to include metrics for health workers, feeling safe walking down the street, substance use, sexual violence, and financial risk protection as part of the UHC index, and looking at further distal social risks, including educational attainment, temperature will be there, precipitation will be in there, and modeling future health scenarios. This is fantastic. 
but it's not enough. It's not enough if you think of the unit of our concern as being our civilization. We've got to go further. So what are the conditions determining civilizational health? I just have five proposals that I quickly want to suggest. The first is the rule of law. We currently have a commission on global health law being led by the O'Neill Institute at Georgetown University, Larry Gostin, John Monaghan, and others, uh, working to try and figure out what the relationship is between law in, and the rule of law and health. And the relationship is an intimate one. Indeed, you can show very close, not causal, Salim, but close correlations between countries that have strong rule of law and their metrics on health. The World Justice Project, Project has identified some universal principles and there is indeed a rule of law index. Those use of universal principles include government accountability, protection of fundamental rights, access to justice, and the presence of an independent judiciary. Without rule of law, we cannot protect and sustain the advances in health that we have created today. Indeed, without rule of law, we may not be able to push ahead with further advances to health. Second, freedom of speech. And I say this passionately as an editor of a, of a publication. Michael Marmot, the great Michael Marmot, uh, said this, uh, a couple of years ago in The Lancet. Health inequalities should be an important part of our argument to change our national and global discussion from one that gives priority, priority to economic growth to one that puts human development at the heart of, of debate. Of course, we absolutely agree. We need to put health inequalities absolutely high on our agenda as a whole series of other issues. But look at what he says. And this is the bit we forget in global health. Because we can put any number of issues that we think technically are important at the top of our agenda. But unless we can have a national and global discussion about those issues, forget it. We just live in our little echo chamber. And to have that national and global discussion means you have to have a free press. Means you have to have freedom of expression and freedom of conscience. Means that you have to protect the fundamental freedom to speak your mind. And sadly, if you look around the world today at freedom of press indices done, for example, by Reporters Without Borders, we see many countries that do not have those freedoms. Countries, I might add, that in the global health community we hold up as exemplars of success. But shamefully, we turn our backs on the protection of other fundamental rights in those countries, including liberty of expression. That is the hypocrisy of our community, and it can no longer be sustained, because I would argue that anterior to any global health priority that the GBD identifies, anterior to that priority is the requirement for free and open discussion in society to be able to raise that issue with politicians and policymakers. Third, human displacement. These figures from the International Organization on Migration, almost 70 million people forcibly displaced, 22 million refugees, 10 million stateless peoples. By 2100, the estimate is that the toxic combination of the environment with billions of people living on the coastal plains, particularly in Asian countries, will produce two billion climate refugees. That's gonna be a big human health problem, a big global burden of disease. We need to start tracking it right now. Fourth, biodiversity. The plants and the animals around us can no longer be ignored. Why is that? Because we depend, our human health and well-being depends on them. The idea of ecosystem services, services provided to us 
that very often we take for granted from those national natural systems. In Nature, just a week ago, a really important paper published looking at the relationship between human well-being that depends strongly on the interacting web of living species. And we need to start tracking metrics for biodiversity, which will shape our health. Indeed, there are biodiversity targets, five targets, 20, um, 20 uh, goals within those priority areas for which we can devise metrics and monitor and track them over time and link them to health. And finally, a, th a fifth area for which I've not been able to find suitable metrics, but this is an area for further work. What is it that's actually going to save not only our civilization, but our biosphere on this fragile planet of ours? It isn't going to be any group alone, any country on its own, any institution working in its unique way. What is actually going to change the trajectory, trajectory of our ability to survive and cooperate together is the concept of solidarity, the degree of social cohesion in our society. A world in which we live where individuals are willing to serve and promote the collective interests of our society. And that means fostering and measuring a deeper commitment among each of us to each other. That idea of solidarity seems to me absolutely foundational to our sustainability as a species on this planet. And finally, a note of humility. 1984, you've probably all read George Orwell. Busalem Sansal wrote a book, 2084, uh, just a year or so ago. And I would strongly encourage you to read this book, titled rather depressingly, The End of the World. But there are some important messages in there for us here, the health metrics community. And here is one of them. It is a common error to believe that the future belongs to us because we possess knowledge. So let us be humble today, let us be humble tomorrow, as we celebrate the knowledge that the global burden of disease has created. And it's a great celebration we should have. But this is no time to be complacent. This is the moment to embrace the dangers and jeopardies in our world and to adapt to those threats that we face and to seize an opportunity to address them together, each of us for each other. Thank you very much.